Hi, it's Dave. Tesla recently held their AI Day 2 and revealed their Optimus humanoid robot prototype, details on their FSD software, and an update on their Dojo training supercomputer efforts. I think what Tesla is doing has the potential to make it the most impactful company ever. So to better understand what's going on, I've asked James Dama, a machine learning expert, to do a series with me going over the slides that Tesla showed at AI Day and to try to explain them in slightly less technical terms. This video is part one and will cover the Optimus humanoid robot. Parts two and three will be on Dojo hardware and software, and then parts four and five will be on Tesla's FSD efforts. I hope you enjoy. So uh, I think this is the first slide in the in the in entire show. They, so they're telling us a couple of things about the robot. They're telling us how many degrees of freedom the robot has, both in its hands and in its body overall. And then the, it, we're getting kind of a little bit of breakdown of two major components. One is the electronics and one is the battery pack. So uh, a couple of interesting points about this. I mean, the number of degrees of freedom a robot has they essentially, they tell you how much, um, what, what is the variety of, of movement that, 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 not just a robot, but anything. For instance, a, a human shoulder has like, this is a degree of freedom, this is a degree of freedom, and this is a degree of freedom. So we basically get three degrees of freedom. Okay. There's kind of independent ways that, that, that the joint uh, can move. So uh, Optimus has 28 total degrees of freedom and including both sides. So for instance, it has three, three degrees of freedom in its shoulder. It has your, your elbow is just one degree of freedom. It just has one, the one hinge point. Wait, actually this is 28 structural actuators. Yeah. So oh. you have an actuator per degree of freedom, oh, okay, right? Got it. So everything that, that, that it doesn't move, that the robot doesn't want to move intentionally, you don't want to move. So nothing moves except something which is moved by an actuator. So you're going to have an actuator for each degree of freedom. Okay. That's a really good point. I mean, can you break down? So we see two actuators kind of near the shins or mm -hmm. so. Um, so there's no actuators in the ankles or foot. That's right. That's the first one from the bottom. And then you have two kind of thigh yeah. actuators. And right. then two one in the front, one in the back. Okay. And then two hip actuators and then a third one in the middle. Is that right? Yeah. The pelvis. I think uh, okay. Tesla called it the pelvis. So that's the one that will rotate the Got it. The body this way. So with these, okay. So let's just look at the bottom half of the robot. So mm -hmm. with each actuator, it's basically allowing one freedom of motion. One degree of one freedom. De one degree of freedom of motion. Got it. So why is there, um, let's go with the bottom, the, mm -hmm. the, the shin um, actually why are there two <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or why why is it there i would like to say that there's two because the the human calf muscle the gastrocnemius which is the the outer muscle on the human calf actually has two heads and it's the same shape which was the first thing that struck me like it's a very aesthetically pleasing choice mm. to do this that that um so the ankle it, it has basically two degrees of freedom in this case. You know, so if, the, if this is the lower leg and this is the foot, okay. it can do this. And then it can also tilt slightly side to side. And the way you do that with two actuators is the two actuators connect to slightly different points on the ankle. Mm -hmm. So if they push in and out together, the foot flexes or extends. Okay. And then if they work differentially, it goes this way. So it's a clever way to use mm -hmm. two motors. You get two degrees of freedom, but one of them is... Uh, one degree of freedom is when the motors move together, and the other degree of freedom you get by, by the differences in how they move. If one goes plus and one goes minus. So you need the side to side for mm -hmm. for lateral stability when you're standing and when you're walking. It allows you to apply a little bit of force to the left or right to help maintain your balance as you're going. And of course, mm -hmm. the foot flexion that's useful for like smoothing the stride, right? That you can uh, instead of like planting the foot exactly flat and moving to the next thing or like planting the foot if it was a rigid hinge you know there'd be these high impulses this allows you to place the foot roll onto the roll onto the foot and then and then step off on on the toe and like uh, human beings we do most people mm -hmm. you plant your heel when you're walking you roll onto your foot and then you step off of your toe and so that kind of rolling motion is both efficient and graceful and it gives you control throughout the stride with the ankle. So they're, so they get these two. Now a human foot has other uh, degrees of freedom, mm. which are less important to locomotion. Um, they're useful. And if you could have them for free, you would definitely want them. But this is kind of the minimum set to be able to get like a graceful, efficient gait, at least as far as the lower leg is concerned. Okay. 
So, got it. so we have actually four, I guess two on both sides of each leg, and then you have mm-hmm. the thigh ones, the hip yeah. ones, and one in the middle. So when you look at this, um, I guess, are they, um, how different are these initial kind of bottom actuators? Um, like, what can you tell from just looking at, you know, this picture here? How different? Yeah, like from each other, like what are the main functions of, you know, the motions of these actuators? Okay, so they... Um, they, they tell us later that they basically, they created six actuators. Mm -hmm. So there's a rotational actuator, which is what you might think of as a, as a, as a motor, you know, it has an axis and it rotates like the, the motors in Tesla's are rotational actuators. A linear actuator is one that has a body and then it has some structural unit that comes out where the actuation is, it slides out or it slides in. Mm -hmm. So they basically, they have two kinds of actuators, the rotational and the linear, and they have three sizes of each. So when they... You know, when you go through the uh, design, first you start out by deciding how many degrees of freedom you need. Mm -hmm. And then you decide, you need to decide how much torque and power you need on each one of those degrees of freedom. You also have to decide, like, how much space do I put the actuator in? You can see, looking at this slide, that the actuators, they're actually taking up a lot of the volume of the body, right? So how big your actuators are and how how you can place them into, you know, they want to maintain this overall human body form, how you can place them kind of constrain some of your choices. So they settled on six, even though they have 28 structural actuators. I mean, you, you could imagine that they might want like 14. I mean, obviously there's left, right symmetry. And you could imagine that you might, uh, you might want to have a, a unique actuator that was totally optimized for every individual. But uh, Tesla decided, and this is covered in a, a part of the talk where they talk about the actuators, that they wanted to reduce the number of actuators to reduce costs and simplify the design overall. And they decided that they could do everything they needed for all the joints. After they did a study where they basically simulated the robot and they had it go around doing a bunch of things, picking stuff up, walking around, bending over, uh, lifting boxes. Um, and uh, they looked at how much torque and power you need. on each. So you know, power is, uh, is like force over speed or torque over speed. So how fast do I need it to move when it's moving powerfully and how powerfully do I need it to move? These are kind of like two constraints. Then there's the question of like, what's the physical form factor? How big is the actuator? How long is it? What does it weigh? And so on. They settled on six designs. Uh, and, and we see all six of those here. Mm-hmm. So the calf yeah. is they, they have a large, medium, and small linear actuator. And they have a large, medium, and small rotational actuator. And we see them in a le- later slide. But mm-hmm. the, the calf is two of the medium-sized linear actuators. And the... The thigh, it has two. The front muscle on a human thigh is a quadriceps, the big one on the front. The back one is a hamstring. These actuators, they don't do quite the same thing. The front one, the front uh, linear actuator on the robot leg operates the knee, and the back one operates the hip. That is, the first one causes the bottom half of the knee to move, the bottom half of the leg to move relative to the top half of the leg, which is what your knee does. Okay. And the, the one in back, it actually attaches to the pelvis and then it attaches to the upper part of the leg. So it moves the upper part of the leg relative to the hip position. So those are two of the large linear actuators that they show later on. Then they have a smaller one and those go in your fingers, right? Got it. So then um, right now in the, in the thigh, it, we're not seeing the back actuator from this picture basically? You can see it. If you look closely, you'll see that there's two. Uh, there's one okay. in front, a little lower, and one slightly behind and a little higher. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. It's like a shadow. Okay. Yeah, there's some other pictures where you can see the two okay. more clearly, so you'll see got them it. there. Okay. Then, uh, you know, um, in your uh, in your wrist, mm-hmm. I mean, in, in the arm, it's important to have this degree of rotational capability, right? Mm-hmm. So there's, a, there, you know, there are actuators in there. Um, the hips, the pelvis is a rotational actuator because we're just rotating, rotating the upper body okay. relative to the lower body. And then the hips are two, uh, I think we have two degrees of freedom in the hips, right? Because they can move this way. And then you can also bend like forward at your hip. Um, so there's two sets of actuators. And all of those are the large actuator, if I'm not mistaken, the large rotational actuator. Then, you know, the upper body, it's got rotational actuators for for doing, I mean, we have three for the shoulder, mm-hmm. and then we have one for the elbow, and then we have, I think there's a total of six degrees of freedom in each arm, right? Or is it seven? Three? Yeah, yeah it might be seven. Seven, six, 13. Yeah, that's right. 
So there's seven in the arm, six in the leg. Then we have the pelvis or the, yeah. So what is the 28th one? That accounts for 27. <laughs> I must be missing one. <laughs> neck? Did you get the neck? No, there's no neck movement. The uh, neck is rigid. Okay, got it. Okay, well, we'll bump into it as All we right. work our way through this. Yeah, okay, yeah. so that's interesting. We we kind of have a diagram of the, of the robot that tells us the basics of what's going on. The battery and the electronics are in the torso. Um, the head mm -hmm. probably has sensors in it. They didn't actually tell us much about the sensors mm -hmm. in this view. So then we have two, They you know, there's two little chunks of the slide. One of them is showing us the electronics board. So the thing that's significant about this uh, is they went to the effort of consolidating all the electronics down to a single package, which, you know, uh, in the Bumble robot, it was mostly built off the shelf. I mean, they might have built some circuit boards that went into it, but the electronics is distributed in all these circuit boards all over the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Consolidating the electronics down will reduce your cost. It can simplify a lot of your wiring. It can make thermal management easier because all your heat is in one place. There's a lot of advantages to, to doing that. It also can reduce your total part count make assembly more uh, easier and whatnot. So so that's a thing that you would mainly do if you were really thinking about production. So I, I think the interesting takeaway there, and also when we look at the battery, you look at the battery, you can see it looks like they have, they have a die cast backing for the battery compartment. They have a stamped sheet metal top for the battery compartment. And then when we look at the insides of it, you can see kind of miniature versions of the things that we see in the Tesla battery in, in like their production battery setup, like they're not only are they putting the battery cells in, th this is, I mean, I look at this and I see a design that's designed to be manufactured in volume. Volume being, this is not something where we're going to build 10 or 100 of them. They're thinking about, you know, you know, if you're going to build 10,000, what makes sense? Mm -hmm. If you're going to build 100,000, what makes sense? It's that class of design. It's not a because if you're only going to build 100 of them and you know and you don't intend to extend the design, you don't put this much effort into the design because there's easier made ways to make mm -hmm. one-off um, For the electronics that are integrated here in the battery pack, how mm -hmm. much of the robot's electronics do you think um, are in this pack versus, you know, in other so parts of the The battery pack doesn't robot. include the electronics. If you look at the picture, you uh, see that, that blue front plate? Okay. The electronics is in like a thin package which is like like a breastplate on the Got front. It. And then in the center of the torso is the battery pack. The front of the battery pack, so the back of the battery pack is probably a structural component for the robot body, which is why you'd want to die cast it. Mm -hmm. you, want to, you want to make it of some fairly beefy chunk of metal. You don't want to stamp it out of sheet metal. Mm -hmm. But the cover on the front of it, you stamp that out of sheet metal because you need a lid. It, it's not flat. You want it to seal because you probably want it to be watertight. You mm -hmm. definitely want it to be fire resistant to deal with the possibility that the battery might fail. Um, it's not clear if they have, it doesn't look like they have liquid cooling in this battery pack. They're probably mm -hmm. just convectively cooled. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's just dissipating heat by coupling, thermally coupling the batteries mm -hmm. to the outside of the case and then using convection or that maybe there's a fan mm -hmm. on there that. So in this picture, the robot with the, what are the, the blue uh, items are, is that the electronics? The blue is the electronics okay. and then the orange is actuators. Got it. Okay. So we see the blue is kind of scattered through, through the body as well. Right. Like electronics. And they cool. mentioned that the, that the hands have 11 degrees of freedom, mm -hmm. although the hands only have six actuators in the hands. There's one for each finger and there's two for the thumb because the thumb can move this way mm -hmm. and it can also move this way. So mm -hmm. you've got two, the fingers just closed, but they have two hinge joints on each finger. So it actually has two degrees of freedom because the tip can, you know, this part of the finger can move. They have mm. this hinge and then they have this hinge also. They don't actually hinge this. There's just a little curved non-active okay. point. And then um, the actuator that's, in, they actually, the actuators for the fingers are in the hand. That's why the palm of the hand is kind of fat. And the, uh, and they're tendons. So there's a spring that, pushes the finger open if the motor doesn't actuate. And there's a wire that runs down the tip of the finger through the finger to a drive unit that has a little reeling spool on it that pulls the finger down. So this only counts as one actuator, but two degrees of freedom, because when you pull the tendon down, uh -huh. both this joint and that joint will both Got close. It. So you're so, kind of wrapped. So the finger actuators are pulling in the fingers like this, right. but the spring is pushing it out. Right. So when you release the actuator, then it, it opens. goes out. And so building hands, 
hands, so in, in human, human hands have muscles in them, like your fingers splay. You have some very small muscles in between the fingers that let you do this. The mm-hmm. robot, uh, Optimus doesn't have this movement, doesn't have this degree of freedom. Mm-hmm. The fingers have a fixed splay Got and it. they close, but it can't do this movement right now. So Optimus mm-hmm. would have a hard time typing on a keyboard, for instance, because it can't like move its fingers laterally to different yeah. keys. I mean, it would have to move its arm, basically, yeah. right? You could, you know, yeah. it could... Yeah. And it'd probably be found. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <right? laughs> and precise. <laughs> it'd be great to see Optimus like working on a Nokia keyboard. Or <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but you don't. So, uh, but the power, like your the finger, mm-hmm. the major finger muscles here, they're here in your forearm. Like these mm-hmm. are your finger muscles down here. Yeah. And you, you can, if you put your hand here and you flex your fingers, you can feel these muscles moving. Mm-hmm. You, the, the, there's there's a set of carpal tunnels here that these mm-hmm. that the uh, that the tendons from these muscles run through, and then these are all tendon activated. And mm-hmm. and we have separate muscles for the different joints and whatnot. So I mean, humans have mm-hmm. human hands are amazing. Mm-hmm. There, it's a lot of power a lot of precision and a very, very small package. But when you're building a robot, if you have a wrist joint that's fairly flexible, having putting the motors in the wrist and having, you know, having an efficient cabling system that goes through a complex wrist to operate the fingers, it's pretty tricky. And they decided for now, what they're going to do is just do small actuators that they can put in the palm. They have a pretty significant gear ratio and the fingers probably won't move fast on mm. Optimus because they need a lot of gearing and they have a pretty small motor in there because it's got to fit inside the palm. Mm-hmm. So that'll be, it'll be interesting to see over time how that aspect of the design mm-hmm. evolves. Cause there's a lot of opportunity to increase the dexterity in, in the short run things, uh, things that Optimus is likely to be used for don't actually require a lot of dexterity. Like if you can mm-hmm. pick up stuff, if mm-hmm. you can roughly manipulate, a, if you can pick up a water ball, pick yeah. up a water can, pick up a tool, pick up a large object, that's sufficient. Um, it's, you know, human hands, uh, like, you know, you can roll a finger, a pencil around your fingers, or you can roll a coin between your fingers. Uh, um you know, being able to hold a pencil the way most people hold a pencil and write your name is an incredibly dexterous, mo- uh, right. you know, movement. And that's the kind of thing that, that the current hand on Optimus wouldn't be able to do. And as long as Optimus is basically doing fairly basic jobs inside a factory, you don't need a more dexterous hand. But right. if you get to a point where you want, you know, if Optimus needs to tie his shoes, he's going to need better fingers. Right. right. Basically, there are things that, that the current hand won't do, even though it's a pretty good hand and it will be able to do a lot. Yeah. Wow, tying shoelaces. Wow, that's going to yeah. be that's tying a shoelaces challenge. is really hard. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, all right, so we we looked at this battery pack um, and then the electronics, a brief overview of actuators. How about this bot brain here? Um, I'm guessing they're using just one system on a chip because you don't need the redundancy of full self driving, right? I mean, it's not like yeah. safety critical, so you just need one. As long as the bot stops moving and it's mm-hmm. in a stable position, mm-hmm. it, uh, yeah, that's kind of an interesting observation. Uh, what happens if you're so dynamic movements are movements where a static movement is a movement where you can stop it at any point and mm-hmm. you won't fall over. Mm-hmm. You're stable with respect to dynamic movements are movements where you have to complete the movement. If you try to stop it in the middle, like you'll fall over. Right. So walking, if you try to walk in a completely static fashion, which you can, uh, no matter where you stop the step, you won't fall over. But that all static walking is really clunky. So the so Optimus is, will be using dynamic walking. So that's mm-hmm. an interesting question I hadn't thought of. Like, what if you're in the middle of a step when the brain suddenly stops? And I think the answer is Optimus mm-hmm. can fall down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But they also, you know, one of the things that they mentioned is that they they – they uh, simulated crashing Optimus so he can fall mm-hmm. on his face and he'll be okay. Yes, definitely. Should we go into the next slide? I should say it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so now this is the knee joint. And okay. you can see in this image, you can see the tops of the two actuators in the cast. Oh, yeah, okay. In the bottom, right? Yeah. And you can see the the thigh, the one on the front of the thigh and the back mm-hmm. of the thigh. Yeah. So you can see that the the one on the back of the thigh, it attaches to that, that triangular 
uh, thing that comes down is the bottom of the pelvis. So that's mm. the act actuation point for the Got pelvis. It. Then And then this, this is the four bar connection that they use. I, I will think they also have a four bar connection for the uh, hip, for the uh, back of the thigh, for the hamstring, mm -hmm. I guess. Now I'll call the front one the quadriceps and the back one the hamstring because that's what we have on okay. human beings. Got okay. It. So is there anything else that's, that you notice is special about that knee, knee picture, that the previous slide? I think uh, yeah. the this slide was sort of put together because they wanted to go into this discussion of using a four-bar joint for the knee, mm -hmm. um, which you know, we can talk about that. They, they have a better slide for discussing that a little bit later, okay. so I thought we could get to it there. So basically, you have two large actuators, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the two, hamstring and the yeah, thigh. Yeah, the two big linear actuators okay. are the thigh ones. And they're two medium-sized ones bottom, for yeah. the calf. Got it. Uh, so this is a different view of the same leg. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're basically, in this one, you can see, uh, you can see the four-bar, I think it's a four-bar link, maybe it's a three-bar link, on the pelvis. And they show the four-bar link that's being used at the knee. Uh, and we'll talk about what that means okay. in just a second. Okay, so this is a good place. So they spent some time talking about, so the mechanical joints. Why don't you just have a hinge, like at the knee? Um, and it turns out if you're a little bit more clever than a knee, uh, than using a hinge, you can significantly change the demand on the actuators. So this graph here, uh, you can see it's the force that the actuator, this is a linear actuator. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, if you have a rotational actuator, you measure the force in torque because it's rotational force. Mm -hmm. A linear actuator, you measure it in force. So that's why, the, uh, uh, that's why on the, you know, the vertical scale here is force. Um, so then they show us from the knee being totally straight to the knee being bent from left to right. As, the, as you bend the knee, how much force the actuator has to apply. So you see, we got two curves here. We got one that starts kind of high, is kind of low and flat in the middle, and then it goes really high at the end. Okay, so if you were designing a motor for to do this, or an actuator in this case, if you're designing an actuator to be able to do this, it has to be able to, it has to be forceful enough. It has to be able to generate enough force to meet that high point right at the bend knee thing. Got it. So it's gotta be, you know, it's gotta be pretty powerful. If you do, if you're clever about building the hinge joint, so that instead of having one point of rotation, mm -hmm. you have multiple points of rotation so that the amount of length that the rod travels changes as the knee rotates. Instead of just being, uh, instead of just being a simple hinge, yeah. the geometry changes so that the actuator has more leverage as the knee bends. Then what you get is the other line. See that lower line with their four bar actuator. You can see that the that the peak force that the actuator ever needs to do is much lower. Mm -hmm. So that makes it a lot simpler to design a good actuator for this joint because you you only have to worry about being able to generate as much force as the highest point Got it. along that whole curve. So this was kind of a discussion about like why are the joints as complicated as they are and what were the decisions that they made. And that actually, I think it leads us into, well, we can skip ahead. Uh, okay. In this slide, when they want to explain the, the process of designing the actuators, they kind of, they're doing a comparison between like, here's stuff we do in a car and here's, here's like the, the kind of robot equivalent. So in, uh, on the left, they're showing, well, what are things that you might evaluate the car against? You know, 0 to 60, 50 to 80, city driving, racetrack, highway driving. You've got a few categories of stuff. car doesn't have very many degrees of freedom. It moves forward and backwards, and you can turn the wheels. So it's like literally got two degrees of freedom, <laughs> a car. A robot's got 28. So in the robot, you've got all, you know, if you think about it in terms of act activities instead, if you want to sort of capture the range of things that you want the body to be able to do, you have to evaluate it among all of these other things. So they have all these example activities, forward walking, walking on stairs, work with an object, squatting, and so forth. So basically, evaluating a design for robot body from a mechanical standpoint, just, just looking at just the most fundamental level is a lot more complicated than the car. Obviously, you can get really fancy, but you can get arbitrarily fancy with anything. Mm -hmm. But to just to do the minimum 
necessary job for the robot compared to the minimum necessary job for the car is significantly more complicated. So in a sense that, you know, the car's got two main actuators, which are the electric motors, uh, and designing them, they've got a relatively small set of, you know, constraints. Like what's my zero to 60 speed? What is it? How does it perform cruising on the highway? And then when I mix this up in city driving, like you could imagine, you could kind of dumb it down to a few categories. Whereas with a robot body, you've got to look at all of these other activities. And of course, to evaluate these activities, the way that you want to do it before you have your robot is you build a simulation. So then you have your simulated robot do these things and you look for each joint, each actuator, how fast does it need to move? And how much force does it need to be able to generate to be able to do this activity with enough margin to be comfortable doing it? And then you combine that with, well, how big does the actuator need to be to fit into where I need it to fit inside that human body, inside the robot body? And then that gives you your basic design constraints. Got it. Uh, so here they're, they're showing sort of an example of the characteristics that you might optimize for one of these. So they have the right hip yaw. So the graph at the left, it's torque versus speed. I was describing those as the two basic, you know, dimensions that you could think about the performance of your actuator in terms of the output you get from it, like how much force can it generate and how fast do I need it to turn? And so they were doing some activity here. Uh, they don't seem to specify. Oh, they've got... Uh, are they walking? They don't, they don't say what the actuation is. But they had some activity that they were doing. And the torque versus speed that, it, that, the, that the actuator went through, you can see how it's cycling back and forth in this graph. And so they walk a number of steps, or they do a number of repeated motions, and they kind of get an envelope. Like how fast does it need to move at any given force level? Um, and then the, this middle graph is kind of a different way of looking at the same trade-off. Um, you know, you, it's once again, it's torque versus speed. And then on this graph, they're also throwing in efficiency because, you know, say that you can, uh, that you can do the torque and speed you need, but you spend a lot of time operating in the, 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 uh, the actuator in a regime where it's got very bad efficiency, right? Well, then, you know, you've met your constraints if it fits in the body and it does what you need it to do, but now it's going to use a ton of power. So they also want to think about that. Another thing that they can sort of optimize in this uh, domain. Anyway, okay. so they're basically demonstrating to us that, you know, uh, we had to think about this on every single joint in the body as part of the process of figuring this out. Okay, so would you say a lot of this they're doing because they're not happy with the off-the-shelf off solutions? They're trying to figure out, okay, if we make a custom robot actuator mm. or, you know, a set of them, like, where do we start? How do we make it yeah. optimal? Because if they were just okay with off-the-shelf components, then I don't know if they would need to do all this well, stuff, Well, right? so on Bumble, they built with, as, yeah. I mean, it seems like the way it was presented and the way they talked about that Bumble, you know, the first generation robot was built with off-the-shelf stuff. Mm. Uh, Bumble's design is really different. Um, so probably if you restrict yourself to using off-the-shelf components, it forces a lot of other changes in the robot body that will make it more expensive, lower range of motion. There's all these trade-offs that, mm -hmm. that you have to do. You, I mean, uh, you definitely want to design your own actuators. Yeah, yeah. Like you're, the options are just way too constrained if yeah. you try to buy this stuff out of a catalog. I mean, these actuators that are off-the-shelf, like are they... What are they being used for? Like where, like what's the main use? I'm guessing it's not robots at this time, right? It's other things. Um, um, I mean, it could be robot arms and factory type stuff. Hmm. It could be robotics in that sense. It could be, you know, factory machinery, okay. printers, agricultural machinery, uh, laboratory machinery. Um, you know, factories is probably a pretty good bet. There, there are a lot of kind of, you know, standard... Uh, you know, actuators, motors that you can buy off of a catalog where a manufacturer, like if, uh, you know, they might have an actuator that's directed at like, uh, you know, for instance, in an, IC, in an IC fab, you have to move integrated circuits around. You have to move these wafers around. And so mm. 
you need a certain degree of precision. You can tolerate so much efficiency. It has to fit in a certain physical size. So they might make a range of actuators, or they might make a standard actuator that you can order from them, and then you can customize, ask them to make small changes. Mm -hmm. But the range of possibilities that you can get uh, is going to be limited to, uh, you know, the building blocks that they have available to put together an actuator for you. Um, you know, it there's there's such a huge design space for actuators mm -hmm. that if you there's a pretty good chance that that in any application where you're going to build a bunch of them, that designing your own is going to get you a much better trade off. Because the, the closest point in the space of possibilities out there, especially if you have an unusual application like a humanoid robot, yeah. it's not like there's a huge industry making you know thousands of different kinds of humanoid robots and all these standard actuators and you can get one this is a new application so you're pretty likely it's to not have an actuator that meets your envelope needs your power needs your connection needs uh okay so. i mean would you say one of the big needs is is efficiency because you've got this limited battery pack you're not running off of you know the wall electricity yeah. so yeah, you can't yeah, ignore efficiency yeah sure. you have to optimize that to mm -hmm. to an extreme degree for everything to work um in an efficient manner i don't know how i mean for optimus is you know their first cut at the specs they're talking about are not super ambitious in terms of in terms of energy requirements they can put it you can put a big enough battery in optimus for uh, to be able to do a reasonable amount of work with it, like two kilowatts and, you know, six, eight hours of continuous work before you need to recharge it. That gives you a decent amount of leeway for given, given the inherent mechanical efficiency that the body, like there's a sort of physics based irreducible amount of energy that the body needs to move. So your efficiency is how, you know, if the, if your mechanical efficiency and the, you know, your, actuator efficiency is like 80 percent then you only, then your battery only needs 1.2 times the fundamental limit uh, that the body requires but it they're probably much closer to like you know 50 percent efficient or something like that in terms of just because it, it's early days this is the first try you know there'd be a lot of refinement to do the, ma the actuators themselves might be quite efficient but if you compare them to the absolute optimum efficiency you could achieve if you had exactly the right joints and exactly the right materials and, and optimized thermals and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. it might be a bit different. They, they gain a, a huge amount by designing their own mm -hmm. actuators. And I don't like anybody who attempted to do something like this, who was going to use off the shelf actuators. They're not serious. You just mm -hmm. can't, you're not going to be able to do a good enough job. Yeah. I mean, who, I mean, maybe, maybe it requires a deeper dive into the robotics companies out there, but I mean, who is, do you know any robotics companies that, that's aggressively making their own custom actuators? I mean, I uh, frankly don't know yeah. enough about the details of yeah. the internal operations of those companies to know. Yeah. I don't know anybody who's, I, well, okay, Boston Dynamics, they make their own actuators, but mm -hmm. they don't use electrical actuators. They use a hydraulic system mm -hmm. for controlling their bigger robots, right? Mm -hmm. The small spot robot, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, my mm -hmm. guess would be that spot hadn't been made in enough volume but the other thing like boston dynamics they don't have to custom make their own actuator like if you were a typical robotics company what you would do is you would go to an actu uh, to an actuator company mm -hmm. and you would do a design study and you'd go talk to them and say we need an actuator we'd like it to do this what can you Got do it. for us and then that would become a design collaboration they'd come back and say well we could do this and you'd look at it and say well that doesn't have enough of this and it's got too much of that and i'd like better efficiency and then they'd tweak it a little and you'd go back and forth and eventually they'd come up with something and then you'd contract them to manufacture it for you a tesla happens to be have enormous expertise in electromagnetic actuators which is one of the reasons why i wanted to see them doing this mm -hmm. because long term doing the actuators is a doing the actuators doing a really good job of the actuators is going to be a big part of getting really good body for a humanoid robot mm -hmm. all right um for this slide here reduction mm -hmm. of unique actuator design so i'm guessing this is where they try to pare it down to what their six choices yeah of actuators so are. each you can see each one of these graphs is now they had another one where they they, which is, the, it's the same thing, but with uh, fewer colors. <laughs> it was black and white. Uh, 
the each of these sort of blobby graphs is uh, is uh, they tried each one of those uh, blobby graphs it has a bunch of dots and each one of those dots is a different actuator trade-off design if you will and uh, you want the 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 uh, once again this is um, this is uh, what was the I forget what the what the uh, axes were on this graph but essentially the two the red X's that you can see on the bottom are the actuator that they designed because it's got the best uh, it has the best performance characters so basically this actuator on this graph lower and to the left is a better design for for what you want so when you consider every joint individually and you consider all the different actuators that you could use for that joint what you're going to do is you're going to end up with this this graph and you go and you pick one of the ones that's toward the lower left as a design that you want to go with in this case they didn't want to make you know 28 different actuators or 14 different actuators they wanted to know how few could we do and still have a good design so uh, in these graphs, there's there's overlap between the actuators, and for the different actions, you can see each, each uh, they they basically color code each of the different six basic actuators they have, and they basically show that that for every single one of the uh, actuators they need in the robot body, at least one of the six they chose is pretty close. It's close enough as makes mo no difference. So they can end up just making six actuator designs instead of making fourteen. Mm -hmm. Got it. And so that's an interesting design study also. I mean, every single one of the dots in those plots is a different actuator that they considered building with different performance characteristics. And at the end of the day, they decided on the two performance characteristics that were the trade-off that they most wanted to look at. And they picked the actuator that was, you know, you know, had the lowest value on both of those two performance characteristics. Mm -hmm. So what's... Um what is the robot body besides these actuators? So you've, you've got these actuators, you've got the electronics, I'm guessing connecting, right? All the actuators together with the batteries, um, also the computer to control the skeleton them. Skeleton and joints, the mechanicals of the body. So right. the rest of it is to fill out the body basically? Well, it's structural, okay. right? So the actuators, for instance, that four bar link on the knee. Mm. Well, first of all, the knee itself is, you know, you have a bone. <laughs> Yeah. in a body, which is the thing that your muscles act on to move your limb. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Optimus has bones and he has these structural elements. Mm -hmm. And then where the bones come together, you need a joint. And the joint will have an actuation point, a rotation point around where the joints, the, you know, the two halves of the joint move relative to one another. And it's the actuator's job to supply the force to allow the joint to forcefully open or forcefully mm -hmm. close. Got it. So you've got the, the, the joints, you've got the bones or the structure, mm -hmm. right? And the actuators, electronics, and then you've got probably the skin or the appearance outside of yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, they'll if, put a plastic carpus on it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they make, um, you know, like a leotard to put over the whole thing. Like if you're working uh, in a dirty yeah. factory or something yeah. like that, it's it'll depend a little bit on the cooling requirements, right? Because you need a certain amount mm -hmm. of airflow because it's dissipating mm -hmm. stuff. Okay. But um and you could just skin it with various things that are cosmetically appealing or maybe protective. If it's working in an environment where it might get knocked over, you might have a structural element to prevent it from hitting its head if it falls <laughs> <Yeah. right? laughs> or something yeah. important and getting bumped. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, the biomechanics of a human body is, you know, it's bones, uh, which are your, you know, they're force transmitted, they're, they provide rigidity. You have muscles, which are the actuators. Muscles mm -hmm. yeah. have, uh, they use ligaments and tendons to connect. In fact, in the, the wires they use for moving the fingers, they actually call it tendon drive. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's actually called that in the industry where you, it, it's a tendon drive is kind of like the brakes on a bike, you know, where mm -hmm. it goes through a cable. That's the tendon. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah, so they have a tendon drive. So there's connective tissue. There's bones that provide structure, and then you have muscles that sit on top of that. And then where you have uh, joints, you know, joints in the skeleton are joints, mm -hmm. and they're your actuation points. All right, pretty pretty straightforward, you know. I guess um, it's not as complicated as I would have first imagined. I guess. Um, I mean, it seems like Tesla is doing like the the biggest things, like the most bang for your buck, which is you need the actuators, you need the joints. Mm -hmm. Right, you need to connect all that to the battery pack, to the computer, 
uh, to get everything working. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, so a lot of companies, a lot of organizations can do the mechanicals. Mm. Um, I mean, a humanoid robot, it has an, it's an interesting design space. Um, the domain expertise for understanding what you need to do, that's a bit separate. But if you have domain expertise, like people who understand the movements that are required pretty well, the mechanical expertise to be able to do like the joints, for instance, that's actually pretty common. Like a lot of companies have to do similar kinds of things. You know, mm-hmm. Everybody, every com- like, you know, car companies, companies that make printers, like any, any company that makes stuff that has mechanical elements to it and like barbell sets, you know, all of this stuff. Sorry, whatever that thing is, mm-hmm. not a barbell. Mm-hmm. But uh, all of those things require mechanical design. Actuator design is a lot more specialized. Uh, and it's also a field where the state of the art is getting pushed pretty uh, substantially recently because it's become possible to design electromagnetic simulators that are also include the mechanics for a motor. So now we can simulate the electromechanical and mecha- and mechanical nature. And in fact, uh, Tesla, mm-hmm. I understand, they design their own simulation software, like they designed their simulators from scratch. Mm-hmm. Because the simulator becomes sort of this super core technology for being able to design mm-hmm. a really good... There, there's so many trade-offs in making a good ac- uh, you know, electromagnetic actuator. And there's so many clever ways you can go about overcoming the design in space is incredibly rich. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of opportunity for creativity and innovation to come up with the best possible actuator. And in some cases, actuators don't matter much. I would argue in a humanoid robot, actuators matter a lot. They're like a super core component of doing a good job. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. All right, let's go next slide here. These are the six actuators. Uh, that they sort of narrowed down to. So you can see they've got three rotational ones. And those are, these are, you could think of that as kind of like an electric motor with some other bits and pieces moving. For instance, uh, some of them will have a clutch. So an electric motor, it's, uh, it, uh, when you aren't applying force to it, it spins really freely. But sometimes you don't want it to spin freely. You like, mm-hmm. you want to bend the elbow and you want it to stay there and you don't want to have to keep putting energy. And so you might put a brake in there mm-hmm. or a clutch, something to lock it in place when it gets there, because that allows you to stop expending energy. You also want, you might want to know how much force you're applying. So you might have a force sensor, a torque mm-hmm. sensor in there. You might want to know the position. You might need a position sensor. It tells you what's the exact angle of it. How fast is it moving exactly? So there are other things. And, uh, all of that stuff frequently will get lumped into the actuator. So it's like it's not oh, just the electric motor. You put the sensors. And okay. I think that's covered a little later. In the the lower mm-hmm. three actuators are screw drive. They're ball bearing screw drive linear actuators. So the main part of the body, the cylindrical fat part of it, is a motor that spins. The inside of that motor has a screw thread, and and there's a screw on the rod that slides in and out. So the motor spins and it screws it in or screws it out. Now, in this case, the screw is not just like a regular threaded screw. It's a, it's a, uh, a semicircular groove that runs around and they have ball bearings that run inside those things. So it's very low friction. In fact, you can back drive these, which is like, even though it's a screw, you can, you can pick up one of these actuators and you can slide it in and out with your fingers because the movement is smooth enough to allow to allow that to go. So that's the linear actuator. So it's a linear actuator because it drives in a straight line. Got it. The others are rotational so actuators. The linear actuator is still rotating though, right? So or the the, the, the so there's a rotating component inside uh, uh, yeah. that turns a screw drive. Goes in and so out. imagine that you you yeah. know you have a, a bolt and a nut, yeah. right? And you hold the bolt still. Um, you know, you if you just turn the nut, it'll push the bolt. Mm, yeah. You turn it that way or you turn right. it this way, right? And that's basically what's going on. The motor's the nut, mm. and it turns. And the linear actuator is the bolt part. It slides that's in and out that. according to that. So um, whether it's these rotary or these linear actuators, they're driven, is it electromagnetic? Yes. Okay. It's, they're essentially, it's a rotating electric <coughs> motor, right? So, so how different is this from electric motors? These actuators. Well, in certain respects, they're really similar. You know, an, an electric motor. There, are, you know, several different ways you can design an electric motor. But at the end of the day, you have a coil of wire, mm-hmm. which is broken up into um, typically three or more different circuits, and 
uh, you energize one circuit and it creates a static magnetic field. You energize another circuit and it creates a similar but rotated magnetic field. Mm -hmm. If you have a third circuit, you get a yet more rotated. So this is like uh, Nikola Tesla's original invention of the three phase motor mm -hmm. was that, you know, if you have uh, a winding, another winding and a third winding and they in uh, then you put an armature inside that. Now, the armature could have just like a fixed magnet on it, for instance. Uh, the, sorry, the, uh, this is the stator and this is a rotator, um, rotor. <coughs> the rotator could have a fixed magnet on it. So, you know, if the if this is north-south and I the, the coil is making it north-south, then, if the, you know, the magnet wants to align. Now, if I turn this coil off and I energize this one, and this is north, that wants to turn to that. Mm -hmm. The third coil turns it further. And if you have three, the... If you have two, you can make the motor rotate. But uh, two has this funny kind of characteristic where sometimes the motor can, it can it doesn't care if it rotates forward or backwards mm -hmm. because of the you know the way the field rotates on that mm -hmm. thing. Um, with three coils, you get fine control. Mm -hmm. It's a very efficient motor. If you and the more coils beyond three that you do, you can get even more fine grained ability. At the limit, what you're doing is you're creating a magnetic field inside this coil, and you're rotating it. So, okay. when you uh, when you energize these, like if you have three, and you energize them with sine waves that are uh, sixty degrees out of phase, uh, what you can do is you can create a magnetic field, and you can effectively you can create a very smooth magnetic field and you can rotate it continuously as the phases shift the peak in the magnetic field goes so if you stick a magnet inside that field it wants to rotate with the field you're generating a force and a, yeah. and uh, to get even more power we can build electromagnetic electromagnets that are very strong compared to permanent magnets in many respects and so another thing you can do is you can put a coil on the inside too <laughs> so you're so you're generating the coil on the inside and the coil on the outside and so uh you know tesla's motors basically do this they didn't tesla's original motor that they did in the model s it didn't have magnets and it didn't need it mm -hmm. um actually that one's a little bit different that's an induction motor where the, the rotor itself is actually a slab of copper essentially so the coils induce a current in the copper that generates a magnetic field and then they act on that magnetic field directly it's super clever mm -hmm. that was uh, tesla's induction motor and there are other designs they use a different design in the model yeah. three and even different designs later but all of these are electric motors yeah. um it's just it's an amazingly rich uh space of clever designs that that you can do mm -hmm. interesting Got it. You were um, <clears throat> at the AI day. You were able to see some of the yeah. Pictures, right? That was actually the, the first, first booth yeah. I went to. Yeah. Um, I was interested in the actuators. I yeah. saw the sign. I went over. Yeah. And uh, started talking to somebody who was there. Yeah, it's it's really cool. It's yeah. great to be able to talk to him. All right. Next slide. Okay, so there's a little bit of detail. So here we see an, a, a cutaway of the linear actuator on the right. Then you can see the planetary rollers. So these are the ball bearings inside the little screw tracks. Um, and uh, yeah, so what is a cutaway? So you can kind of see in the orange bit at the end, you can see the ends of the coils that make the sort of long, skinny electric motor that spins on the outside and then turns the turns the screw that pulls that ball bearing thing in. The rotator, uh, the rotation, um, the rotating actuator on the left, mm -hmm. they're basically showing us a cutaway that has, well, so this one has a mechanical clutch in it. So it can, actually a, a brake will, gives you the ability to lock the position of the rotor. A clutch allows you to disconnect the rotor from the actuator. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so the, so the, uh, so basically you're no, you're not mechanically collected. So the, maybe you could move the arm without the thing having mm -hmm. to be, um, actuated, or you could allow a joint to move without having to energize it. Got it. This is the next slide on that. So, so this slide is a, you know, a different kind of uh, tear away of the same two motors with some different details. They, they had a couple of stages that they went through and I took each one of these slides so we could talk about the bits. Um, one of the 
problems that you run into using uh, rotate uh, uh, rotary actuators on humanoid robots is that um, the amount of torque that you can, that is the amount of rotational force that you can generate with electric motors is very high at zero velocity. And then as they go faster, eventually once you're turning fast enough, the amount of rotation, uh, the amount of force falls off, but that doesn't fall off until you get to really high speed. So uh, most electric motors, they have this interesting characteristic that um, they can generate a lot of power by virtue of turning fast. So the power you get out of a motor is the amount of torque times how fast it's turning. So you can basically make a motor, uh, if you need a lot of torque for an application, you can get that by having a relatively weak motor and turning it fast and then using a gearbox to gear it down. So what, that, what the gearbox does is it trades rotational speed. It turns rotational speed into more torque. So robots, we want the actuators to be small because they got to fit inside the body. But they also need to be pretty high torque uh, because the, and, and the joints don't move very fast. So it's very tempting to, to use a gearbox in this application because it lets you use a much smaller motor that turns fast and then gear that down so you have more torque for the joint. Uh, but one problem with gearboxes is that, I mean, well, first of all, gearboxes are lossy. They have friction. They take up space and they can create backlash, which is, you know, gears never fit together perfectly, yeah. right? You can try to make them, but there's always a little tiny bit of slack in there, especially as they wear. So that slack, the ability of one gear to move without the other one moving, that's called backlash. And it's that backlash increases the more gear stages you have. Mm -hmm. So if you just have two gears together, you get so much. But imagine that you have this, this gear turns a gear, and then that one turns a gear, and that one turns another gear. And so like a lot of gearboxes that have three or four stages, and the backlash can get pretty large. Backlash is really bad in a robot body. Anytime you need to do a precision moment, movement that might have to move back and forth because it creates the spot where like imagine you want to move the arm and then you want to move it you need to move it the other way like when you're walking your hip has to move forward and then it has to move backward well what happens if there's if there's a gap you know it moves forward and then the motor reverses but it has to take up all the slack and then it engages so you uh so uh that makes it harder to control because you get this lag in the control and it also creates these weird force things where like when you're taking up the, when you're turning the motor through the backlash gap, the motor's freewheeling because the gear's not engaged. So it starts turning really fast mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden your gears hit, boom, mm -hmm. right? So you get these force pulses and, and it's hard on the gears too. Like gears, you know, they have backlash, backlash leads to wear and tear. So you want really simple ga gearboxes. So they, they use a really clever uh, design called a str strain wave gearing is also called a harmonic drive where you have a gear inside that deforms and is slightly elliptical and it's driven by a roller. This is hard to visualize. Yeah. I can pull up a picture to explain yeah. it. But the net net is, is it's a super compact gearbox yeah. that, uh, that lets you have relatively high gear ratios that you can that you can that you can turn to in a small space. So they integrate that into the actuator. So once again, they allow them. It allows the motor to turn faster for a given amount of torque. So it gives you a better trade off in the physical characteristics of what you can easily get in a motor versus what you want, what you need for your robot. Got it. And then you know they describe various sorts of bearings that are designed to stabilize against uh, uh, ax axial loads. Uh, and uh, lateral loads on that you the the body also needs like because these actuators are they become structural members because we're like literally mm -hmm. hanging the arm off of this it needs to have a lot of structural rigidity against different types of forces it would go on so the actuator designers are walking us through like the different things that they pulled in here um so, you know, this isn't just an electric, this is not just a simple electric motor. There's a lot of stuff going on inside each one of these actuators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should we move on? Yes. Okay. Another cutaway, even more bells and whistles that they have inside these things. Now they're showing us the magnets. You can see in the rotors, those red and blue things. Mm -hmm. um, so these are, they have permanent magnets inside these motors, apparently. 
um, the coil wraps around that, that, which is the white bit that wraps around the thing. They're showing us uh, roller bearings uh, and then the uh, on the linear actuator side, a for, both a force sensor and a position sensor that are also integrated. Okay. Um, and then on the rotating sensor one, magnets, and then they also have a position sensor and a torque sensor. Oh, and that, right, and they have an output position sensor because the clutch allows you to disconnect the input and the output, right, so that one can rotate relative to the other. So you need two position sensors. Mm. Interesting. So actuators are complicated. They have lots of bells and whistles. Tesla put a lot of effort into uh, thinking about ex what are exactly are the actuators that we need for this design and then designing the best small set, six unique actuators um, that would let them get what they needed to uh, out of their design. Yeah. I feel like with the Optimus version 2 demo, it didn't highlight the work that they put into the actuators because no. it's not like it hasn't been realized to fruition yet, you know? Yeah. So I feel like it was almost um, two separate almost presentations like yeah. like it feels like that like this is actually much more impressive than you know just the body of the robot yeah. that they showed right because this is what is going to be you know driving everything but once um, again the people that they're that uh you know they they want to come work on the actuator team mm -hmm. the people that they want to come work on the mechanicals of the robot they'll look at the, they don't need to see the robot walk. they know yeah. what's going to go i to some sure. extent having the robot you know demonstrate all its degrees of freedom yeah. and good control and that stuff that's the software and yeah it it's uh it's not this part of the thing yeah i i was also thinking there could be an advantage of not of showing a not kind of fully ready functioning robot in the sense that there could be some designers who are like i want to help make that you know work make for, yeah you yeah. know like there if you show something too polished it's like oh mm -hmm. you know you're not as motivated so, yeah <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean i think um yeah it would be very tempting for some you know, of the best you know engineers uh to definitely this want to work on it i mean i don't know to what extent people like in the mechanical space would understand what a long road this is going to be hmm. um it there's so much potential like I'm, I'm not casting shade on where they are now they've they've in nine months like it's a shocking amount of ground to cover in nine months when hmm. you started like yeah. they're really kind of starting from first principles on this thing. They really went back to the drawing board and re and rethought all the different elements of this. And, and that, you know, I mean, I think they'll have built everything from raw materials in this robot. Right. I mean, hmm. not the printed circuit board. Yeah. You know, maybe they make the batteries too, but you mm -hmm. know, the, I mean, the case is you make that out of raw metal, right? It's just cast, you know, sheet metal stamped ca casing. These, I understand the the at the at the current stage they're 3D printing most of the elements of these uh, of these actuators and then milling them down. I mean, mm. they're literally being made from billets of metal and strings of copper wire. They're not yeah. You know, they're they're going all the way back to yeah. the beginning in order to design this thing. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking there's a lot less suppliers they'll they'll need to rely on, you know, for the robot, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I don't it doesn't say I mean, God, it looks like the position sensors. I was thinking like, the, you know, are they buying an optical encoder? It doesn't look like uh, optical encoder is a kind of position sensor. Mm -hmm. um, maybe specialized materials for the torque sensors and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but that, once again, that's a material. I, I, you know, they're probably buying the ball bearings, right? <laughs> <laughs> there are some things that they're definitely buying in here, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So they're not manufacturing their own rod stock. They probably buy stainless steel rod. Mm -hmm. um, Got it. Okay. You, yes, I see through? it. Yep. Uh, the hand design. So we talked a little bit about this already. Biologically inspired design. In this case, it's like we got five fingers. Um, why five fingers? They talked about that because yeah. we want it to be a drop in for things human beings do. And there are a lot of things that human beings do that work best if you have five fingers. The thumb is a little awkward. It's not quite a biologically, it, it's pretty good. It's an opposable thumb mm -hmm. and it has the minimum two degrees of motion that you need to be able to do stuff. And they were constrained, as we said before, by they needed to get all the actuators in the hand. 
because that really simplifies the risk design and releases a lot of constraints. So this is the kind of thing that you could see a lot of change in the future, mm-hmm. potentially. You know, they, it could be at some point they decide they want a much stronger grip or they want the fingers to move a lot faster or they want to flatten the palm. Actually, so one of the constraints, the palm is actually thick enough right now mm-hmm. that like if your palm is too thick, there are some kinds of mm-hmm. tools that don't work quite as well. Mm-hmm. So right now... Optimus has to hold a tool kind of up close to his fingers. A human being, you hold a tool right across your palm, but uh, Optimus yeah. palm is a little bit too fit for that. Yeah. So, you know, it can do a lot of it can do a lot of the same things. It's not going to be a perfect drop in for every kind of hand tool, right? Like, I don't. It'd be interesting to see Optimus try to use like a, a, a power drill, right? Um, it might work well. Mm. Hard to say. Interesting. Got it. Um, so they, they 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 bring us into the uh, a little bit of details about that. You can see the thing I was saying about the palm and the adaptive fingers mm-hmm. thing there. How you know the thumb kind of sits a little bit farther back. That you know tools are going to sit more at this angle in the hand, whereas a human being it's more at a slanted angle. Maybe they'll be able to do that equally well. Apparently, the fingers are all identical too, which is neither here nor there. Yeah. That probably a human could would work just as well if all your fingers were the same length. Um, carry a 20 pound bag, use tools, precision grip. So uh, they're not going for super powerful grip strength on this. There will be uh, carrying a 20 pound bag, you know, that's fine for carrying a bag. There are plenty of, of manual operations you want to do where you might want more than that. So we could see wanting to go better. That It's a fine starting point. Mm-hmm. Like that's definitely a useful amount of grip strength. Uh, it's not overwhelming. You can do, you know, you can handle any kind of medium light object that humans might handle in a factory. Got it. So um, six actuators, so you have four in the fingers and two for the thumbs? Yeah, so you got one for mm-hmm. each yeah. finger. And then your thumb has two. It's got this, this one and this one. Got it. And so 11 degrees of freedom. So, you, they're, so the, the fingers, fingers are just one each, right? Or, or uh, no. Uh, all the fingers and the thumb, uh, um, they have, like I mentioned before, they don't have this joint. This is rigid. They have yeah. this joint and this joint. But they only have one actuator that does both. So what happens is yeah. when the actuator for the finger uh, you know, pulls the finger down, this and this move together. Uh, so are they cutting that grip. as two fing- two Yeah, this is two, two degrees, degrees of, of freedom, but one uh, actuator. They have to move together. I so see. like in, a, in an interesting sense, you could say, well, it's kind of one degree of freedom. Mm-hmm. That is, it all, it's one variable that can be used to change the shape. So, But uh, mechanical engineers mm-hmm. use degree of freedom as like literally a single rotation I point. Right? Okay, got it. And then adaptive grasp. What does that mean? Does it mean there's sensors where it could change yeah, the Yeah, it the must force? mean that. Okay. Non-back drivable fingers, what does that mean? Okay, so the finger drive, so I mentioned that on the linear actuators that Mm. they had that I had picked up, linear actuators frequently, they have a high enough ratio on the screw drive and enough internal friction that essentially if the motor doesn't rotate, they're locked. Kind of Mm. like, you know, you know, you can turn the screw on a bolt, right? Mm -hmm. But if you try to, if you hold the screw, even if you let it rotate and you pull the bolt, you don't feel a lot of rotation force on the screw. It just, the friction prevents it from moving. So back drivable means you can push on the actuator. You can apply a force and it'll turn backwards, right? Mm-hmm. That is that you can use a force to turn the motor, not just mm-hmm. use the motor to generate force on the linear actuator. Um, so usually you don't get, yeah, back drive is a function of friction and the high gearing ratio that you get inside it. But you can also... Uh, you can also have a brake or something inside mm-hmm. there. You can have a mechanical thing that does it. In this case, I think it's the friction and the ratio that is preventing that. Uh, so it's basically when it's grasping something, it's not going to let it, like if it's a lot of, if it's heavy, it's not going to open up the fingers, like by itself, the weight itself. Yeah, Because right. it's like stuck. So if you were to there. pull the grip yeah. closed, yeah. Uh, you know, up to the 20 pound mm-hmm. force that they have there, yeah. the weight alone wouldn't be enough to turn the motor and force the fingers to exactly. come back open. Okay. Without you having to continue uh, applying torque to the motor. Mm-hmm. All right, sounds good. And then the clutching finger drive is essentially uh, 
you know, it, it basically the, the actuator turns and it turns the screwdriver that turns this gear that you see. And mm-hmm. there's a little spool next to it that spools the wire down that pulls the finger. Because there's a clutch, you can, re- you can disengage there and it will just pop itself open. So basically, mm-hmm. you can release the wire from being connected directly to the drive Got so it. that the spring can easily open it back up. Okay. Interesting. Okay. And they, can they, can they, op- how do you open up the finger slowly then? Like you would run the motor backwards. Backwards, I see. Yeah. Leave it engaged and run it backwards. Slowly. Okay. But then if you, if you apply the clutch, it would just go back, it would go faster. Yeah, it would be faster okay. than that. Okay. It, it'd, it'd be limited spring. by the friction on the spool. Spring. And okay. Friction and inertia on the gear. Makes sense. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think the point of this slide is to basically show how they can adapt the vision system that they have on FSD to the needs of the car. So you can see that they have, you know, on the top, they're showing us the left pillar camera, the fisheye, and the right pillar, which is like the fisheye is the wide angle forward. You know, mm-hmm. you, you, there's a three cameras on the front of the car, the, the, which are called narrow, main, and fisheye. And the fisheye is pretty wide. And then the right pillar camera is on the is the right side facing forward and to the right, and mm-hmm. the left side facing forward and to the right. So between them, they give you 180 degree forward view in three segments with the middle camera overlapping quite a bit. Uh, so I think what they're basically apply- implying here is that they could take the left pillar fisheye and camera code from the car with a little bit of adaptation. And here we on the bottom, we have their occupancy network output, which we talked about before. And they and you can essentially take that network, plug it right in the occupancy network. And uh, and Optimus has a pretty good sense of what's around him, like just with that. Yeah. Um, now, there is a little bit of an adaptation. You can see that the little voxel cubes are much smaller for Optimus, and he's got a much taller stack of them. The the 30 centimeter odd voxel size for the car means that you have the car only needs to see up about 10, you know, because that's well above the height of the car. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the voxel maps for the car, that's what you see. You see about 10 voxels stacked up mm-hmm. and then they go out, you know, 100 meters or something like that. Uh, in uh, Optimus case, like he cares a lot less. Is it okay to call him he? <laughs> Is that a guy's yeah, name, Optimus? <laughs> Could that be a girl's name? Uh, it. Uh, I am anthropomorphizing my anthropomorphic <laughs> object here. Um, it doesn't, you know, he doesn't need to see 100 meters, right? Yeah. So you can spend less of your occupancy resources trying to see far away because you're moving fast in the case of a car. And you can spend more of it getting more resolution and being able to see higher. Got it. So that's... They're adapting, basically. Yeah. The octopus network. But yeah, to a yeah. first approximation, you could take the, pretty much the same code, uh, change some of the parameters, like the mm-hmm. output, you know, tensor sizes for and dimensions to, and you know, pretty much run the same thing. Run different training data on it. You know, so you know, somebody puts on some glasses, runs around headquarters, and captures a bunch of data. You know, you maybe they made a hat with a fish eye and a couple mm-hmm. of pillars so that employees could run around inside and gather some rough data to do their initial occupancy maps for this. And then, you know, once you've got Optimus walking around, he can gather his own data. Because that's how the, uh, <coughs> that's how FSD did it. They gathered data, mm-hmm. right? And they did this uh, supervised, self-supervised hybrid kind of training uh, system to basically build up all of the front end that they needed to get to the occupancy network. So you would uh, probably not use much of the same data for for various reasons, not the least of which is the output is a different shape. We talked about the voxels being different sizes and you need more of them and they're a different layout. So the voxels from the car, you know, that you can't use that training data here. Um, can Tesla you know, do something where like how they using cars to do multi-trip kind of, you know, establishing a ground truth, but then taking Mm -hmm. that into simulation. Can they do something like with Optimus where they just have multi-trips through the office? That would work. Come up with 
better and better ground truth that leads to simulated environments and then yeah. train them. Of course, what that. constitutes ground truth for a robot mm -hmm. is a little bit weirder but like you know he's got no lane lines he's got no stop signs you know a lot of the things that you mark in the car that mm -hmm. are you know the yeah. sort of uh you know invariant aspects of the environment that it's moving through like in traffic mm -hmm. it kind of is invariant right i mean usually you drive down the road and you got two lane lines and there's nothing but asphalt in between them unless there's another road user mm -hmm. there whereas like in a human environment there are more things that could move around you can kind of i mean you can see they've got uh, in this scene, they've got Optimus like walking down an aisle, which is kind of like a road. Like he's got to pass through a bunch of obstacles. Yeah. So a lot of the basic concept still applies. Yeah. But the boundaries, uh, like it wouldn't be surprising if every time you walk down this hallway, some of those boxes have moved, right? So it might be a bit more dynamic for a, for an environment. But, you know, they in, in this, they've clearly, all the white stuff is, sta is presumably static objects. And then you've got these two green things, which are employees, mm -hmm. right? So the, those are dynamic objects moving through the environment, which they're, you know, the occupancy network labels blocks as dynamic if it sees them moving relative to the background. We saw that in, you know, mm -hmm. in the, the little bus thing where they had the mm -hmm. articulated bus that pulls out in a lane. Mm -hmm. And initially, all the voxels for, for it are coded the, you know, not moving object stuff. And then as soon mm -hmm. as it starts moving, they change colors. So in this case, the voxels for those two humans, they're, co they're green. So presumably that's the, it's a moving around thing in the mm -hmm. voxel space for Optimus. Makes sense. All right. That's good. So this is, these are other sort of aspects of them basically demonstrating how they can take tools that they've developed for FSD and make them useful for Optimus. So this synthetic view rendering and volumetric depth rendering, these are both things that they've showed us on FSD before. The volumetric depth, that's, this is a depth heat map mm -hmm. where uh, the, bright, the brighter a color something is, the farther away it is. So this is, a, this is a picture where the color of the pixel is how far away that thing is at that pixel. What's a synthetic view rendering? So this is them turning it. This is, they made a, um, I can't tell if this is a Unreal Engine or not, or a Nerf. Mm. Uh, th so they're doing one of two things. So they're taking the, the, the volumetric rendering and they're generating a Nerf from it. Or, you know, which is something that they do in FSD. And the point of this is not so much to talk about how this, in particular, this is useful, but to show that, they have all these tools that they developed for FSD, and there's a whole lot of them that they can immediately apply to the problem of mm -hmm. uh, getting Optimus trained up. Got it. Okay. Visual navigation. Uh, yeah, so this, they're showing that they're using uh, SLAM, uh, which is... Uh, kind of a structure from motion. There's There are a couple of different ways that you can do simultaneous localization and mapping, which is what SLAM is, S-L-A-M. Um, where uh, this is, this the SLAM they're doing here, this is not a neural network thing. This is a heuristic thing, uh, which has been around for a while, where they take a visual field, they run, uh, they filter it, looking for high frequency elements, like places where the color suddenly changes from one color to another. And then they treat those as landmarks inside a volume of space. So they end up, those features end up being like little beacons. Uh, and as you move through an environment, it's like you have all these little beacons in 3D. And you add, the way those things move around you tells you how you're moving because those mm. are all static objects. Yeah. So it's a way of understanding where you are. That's the localization. Localization is figuring out where, where the, you know, the ego is, in this case, Optimus, right? And then mapping is basically tying a bunch of slam frames together to try to remember, create navigation uh, landmarks and create a, they might not be mapping in this case. Yeah. They might just be using localization, but essentially this is a, this is a pretty well tried and true uh, classic robotics mechanism uh, method for uh, the robot to use its vision to be kind of like a balance sensor and to localize itself and understand how it's moving through the environment and whatnot. Um, I noticed on this slide, um, I asked one of the the AI team members, I forget which desk, but they're showing kind of an image with driving that had these dots as well. Mm -hmm. And um, 
they're saying that it's like points of interest that they could latch onto for each yeah. frame, right? To see it across frames, right? Uh, to track them. Yeah. So it seems like they're doing this already for for driving, yeah. right? And they're just using. They haven't shown over. us this in cars, okay. to the best of my knowledge. It's not surprising that they mm -hmm. use it for some things. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, it's a it it's a technique that's been around for a while. It's generally useful for doing this kind of stuff. And you know, mm -hmm. if you if you have mm -hmm you know, multiple frames of video and you're trying to turn that into how am I, you know, what does what I'm seeing tell me about how I'm moving, right? It's yeah. a way of converting one of those into the other. And you need landmarks for that that yeah. are in three space, right? I thought I saw saw this, um, these dots and a few driving videos. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe they're using them more often now with them um, driving as well. Uh, I remember quite a while back, I remember them showing us uh, demo, uh, sort of a slam visualization. Mm. I call it, I mean, I don't know that 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 they're actually doing mapping. I just use mm. that term because that seems to be the generic term that gets yeah. used for this stuff. All right. Sounds good. Uh, okay. Um, learning to walk. So this is a still frame from a little video that they gave us that basically showed... Um, the uh, the evolution, you know, how Optimus ability to walk sort of changed over a span of from it starts from April and it ends in September. Um, so initially, you know, his holding his arms still not moving his hips at all and just trying to walk by just moving the legs. So, you know, in the vision, he starts like he's crouched down pretty low and he's got his knees really bent and he's walking in this really clunky way. And then uh then they, you know, once they get that working, then they add another degree of freedom, which is the pelvis. So now he can move his, he can not just walk straight, but he can turn his hips, you know, which makes it a lot more efficient and stable and graceful. And then once they've got that working, they let him start swinging his arms because that balances the body overall, right? And then it gets even more smooth. And then toe off is when instead of placing the foot flat, you go down with your heel, you roll forward, and then you step off your toe as you go. So it makes your stride longer and stop, makes it so your head doesn't move up and down so much. Hmm. Interesting. So, and they did this, like they started in April, Yeah. you know, and what, April, May, June. So it took them, say, so they basically had two or three months to, to, okay. to before they, they had the basics working well enough that they integrated the pelvis. And then it took them one month to go from pelvis to adding the arms. And it took them one more month from August to September to like get the toe off. So where are they now? October, November, December? Yeah. The progress would be pretty quick. I mean, that. do you think this timeline, is it for this v version two, I guess, of Optimus? Or is it for the Bumble C timeline? Or They're showing us Optimus. Optimus, yeah. So it seems but like yeah, it kind of seems like Bumble would be the robot that it, we would be talking about. But yeah, because like first steps in April, I don't know if they had... Maybe. It, it may be that, that they've got Optimus walking, but mm -hmm. they can't take him off. So a, a classic thing, mm -hmm. this is especially true of bipedal robots, mm -hmm. is that, is that um, when, you're, when they're learning to walk, they fall down a lot. Mm -hmm. And unlike human beings, they don't start 18 inches tall. So when they mm -hmm. fall, <laughs> they hit really hard yeah. and they break. So usually when you start working with a humanoid robot, you have an overhead crane and you hang like a loose tether. So when it falls, like it gets, you know, the tether yeah. catches it so it doesn't fall. And uh, maybe they just didn't want us to show us uh, Optimus walking on a tether. Yeah, yeah. I, this is simulated, the stuff we're looking at here. Right? Uh, okay. The animation yeah. wasn't uh, okay. a real Optimus. Got it was it. simulated. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, what, what's your take on them saying that Bumble C, it was their first time walking without a tether on, like... Like, is that, to me, it seems like extremely risky to, to try it without, with, to try it for the first time in front of, you know, millions of people on, on screen. Or are they, is it walking so confidently already with a tether? It's like, oh, what the heck, you know. If they're probably pretty confident yeah, okay. when they brought it out. Yeah. Um, the, uh, and they're probably, it's probably walking a fairly static pattern that only assumes mm -hmm. it's on flat ground. And Got it's it. timed and that kind of stuff. So it's not dependent on, like, it's not confused by the lights. Yeah. It's not, you know, going to get messed up because the floor texture is weird or something like that, which a more adaptive algorithm, mm -hmm. you know, the first time you put it in a novel environment, it might have a real problem. If the only thing it cares about is that the flat floor is flat and there are no obstacles, which mm -hmm. you could certainly be doing at this point, yeah. it's not super dangerous. In 
in practice, when you're working with humanoid robots, you just never take them off the tether, mm. you know, because you never know when some silly thing's going to happen. Then you break the robot. And now That's you got to spend two days fixing yeah, it, right? Yeah. You just keep it on the tether the whole time. So it, that may be, you know, it, it does show some confidence. I don't want to say there's no confidence there at all. Um, but, you know, it would just be another Cybertruck moment if it fell. <laughs> I mean, they know they can recover from these, these yeah, I kind of <laughs> wanted Elon to say, let's see what the version 2 can do until it falls on its face. You know, like, how far they push it. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Sounds good. Any other slides here? Is that the last one? Oh, that wow. That's we got through one. all of them. Okay. Oh, what do you know? So I guess that's cool, one cool. video down. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fun. Actually, I, I love this uh, approach, actually. Just like focusing on um, the slides and the technical stuff helps me to appreciate it more. Um, actuators, Tesla's approach. Um, yeah, I think for me, the just going through it with you together, um, <clears throat> more appreciation for the level of detail and thought on the design, the actuators, um, the initial kind of porting over of FSD, kind of their stack seems promising. Um, it seems like, you know, there aren't any kind of red flags. It seems like they're doing the right things, like in terms of getting the body together, you know, making the right decisions with, you know, the battery pack, the joints, the whole thing, working on the brain simultaneously with FSD. It just seems like it's a matter of just like step by step hitting milestones. And hopefully we'll be, you know, privy to see this stuff every AI day or something. Um, yeah, it, yeah, I mean, one of the things that really, I mean, there are all these things that you know in the abstract, and then you go there and you see it, mm -hmm. and suddenly it feels different. Yeah. And I think I'd mentioned before that, you know, I know there are a lot of people working on this thing, but you only ever see three or four faces, right? And mm -hmm. so you go and you see all these people, and somehow it's just much more real. And yeah. so one mm -hmm. of the biggies on me is, like, I, I know there's all these things that have to be, building behind the scene like there's all of these technologies that they have to be working on but you know when you get the presentations like we get they talk about three things in the neural network out of maybe 300 that mm -hmm. have to be going on and we only hear about three of them yeah. so there's a part of you which is like you know like how you just you, you kind of get a much a diminished sense of like how big the effort is how much is going on how much they're sweating the details, how many people are working on it, how much effort it's taking to do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And in this presentation, more than previous presentations, they've given us a lot of little glimpses at things. You know, I mean, the evolution of walking thing, this is not an intern doing this for like, you know, for mm -hmm. four months or whatever. Like it takes real effort to get this stuff going. And for each one of these slides, you know, that the, the actuator design slide, and that, like that's a lot of work. And they're, they're giving us a chance to see just how much work and how much resources they're pouring into this, which of course tells you like they're really serious about it. This is not a lark. Yeah, I was. Um, it was in interesting to see Ashok, um, who's leading the Tesla FSD program, um, kind of be very. It seems like he was. He's very involved with the robot side too. Mm -hmm. Just and it seems like the whole team is really has bought into that vision of the robot and they understand the yeah. significance and everybody I talked to on the yeah. FSD team also had some, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, they were doing something on the robot and several of the people, people I talked to on the FSD team were like, you know, all I'm doing is robot these days. Right. Like, yeah. They're really, you know, yeah. it's a real thing. Yeah. It, it just is interesting that, you know, the FSD or the whole AI teams, um, they have just quickly kind of bought in and really lashed into this, you know, ro the whole robot vision. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> I mean, it is, it is the holy grail of robotics and AI. You it's know? just like, like, it's going to be so fun. Like, exactly, who, who would yeah. not want to work on that? Yeah. And it's also interesting though that like, it seemed like more than half the questions were, were related to kind of robots, you know, like, it, mm -hmm. or AGI even, or just robots, the future. And it just seems like it, it crystallizes the future of Tesla's AI path more concretely than just FSD or robotaxi. Like that's cool, like transporting people, you know, and these smart like AI cars, et cetera. But the humanoid robot form 
combining that with AI, mm -hmm. it just is a completely different level of possibilities. And or disbelief, a completely different <laughs> level of disbelief. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the I, 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 I wish I could remember the context more clearly, but I remember the first couple of times there, you know, you, you know, that Elon was in front of some people and he was talking about, yeah, the cars will be driving the cells around. We'll take the yeah. steering wheels out. <laughs> right now. And you just like, <laughs> yeah right <laughs> you know, which is just yeah. like that's the, there you know there are people who buy into that vision right yeah. but the but the level of skepticism is palpable you know when you interact with people yeah. like even the people who believe it you know there's a component of like they want to believe it yeah. you know but they don't really have the details and to get bought in it's like oh wouldn't it be cool if that happened i so want that to, yeah. to go and now the robot kind of feels like that right yeah, now yeah. that it um yeah and it's going to change. Yeah, yeah. It's it we it's going to be a little while yet before uh, I think you we get dynamic demonstrations of Optimus doing stuff that really yeah. surprises people. And yeah. it, like in the same way that people who've been paying attention are quite surprised by what FSD can do now. Yeah, I think one of the the biggest bullish things about Optimus is the rate of progress with FSD right now. Mm -hmm. It's like compared to a year ago when we were. I think it was back in like summer of last year, we were testing it out together. Like there was, we had a ton of interventions mm -hmm. and different issues, but like just the past few days, I'm driving around Austin. I'm trying these like 15 to 20 minute drives that mm -hmm. are, you know, going to downtown or back, just like these pretty moderately challenging, not super mm -hmm. easy, not super hard, but I'm getting like good three or four, you know, non intervention drives in a row. And I'm like, wow, this is, improved a lot since six months ago and night and day compared to like 12 months ago just the level of confidence and what it's able to do and that it's like to me that's one of the i want to say missed stories but it really mm -hmm. feels like in the in it kind of creeps up on you yeah right? it feel, yeah it feels like in the bigger kind of um general public uh um knowledge or kind of closeness to it, they're just not tracking the progress it's mm -hmm. just not they're not aware of it yeah. but if you if you're driving this car every day or you're tracking you're like wow this is crazy this car is like getting really really yeah. good fast and even though it's still like it's not the way there, to but, know what yeah. fsd is doing like yeah. you can study the tech and you can read the numbers and we can think about the interventions and we can talk mm -hmm. about you know like all the YouTube videos and that yeah. kind of stuff, but there really is, there is no substitute for driving it a lot yeah. over time and seeing the air. Like yeah. that's how you know what the yeah. what the case is because it's just too hard to explain. Yeah, to yeah. I, it's like I was going through these these curvy roads, um, and then you know it just like stops at the it slows down at the right time, mm -hmm. speeds up, slows down yeah. around the car, curves, and it's like exactly what a human would do. I'm like. It reminds me of what you were talking about in an On earlier chat. Yeah, it's just like... Like, I really recommend, so like, if you get a chance and you're up there yeah. and you feel like going to Mendocino, like, do that drive because it's yeah. just like, it, like, yeah. I couldn't believe it. It was beautiful. It was just <laughs> really great. So yeah. my sister was gracious enough to loan me her car while I was there. So I've been driving the FSD around Austin mm -hmm. every day. And Austin has all these unique yeah. sort of things that you just don't see in California. And, like... I'm surprised, it, like, it's doing so much better because I've, you know, she's had FSD for a long time. Every time mm -hmm. I come visit, I borrow the car, I drive yeah. around Austin to see how it's doing. Austin is a lot tougher for FSD than California is in general. Like, I've driven a lot of places in California. So whatever you're experiencing here, like, there's a pretty good chance that if you went to California, like, you'd be, it's, in California, like, non-intervention drives, they're the norm for me. Like, mm -hmm. I want to say, like, I have a necessary, well, not intervention, uh, disengagement because sometimes i'll change the speed i'll do yeah. stuff like that or yeah. like tell it to go faster through an intersection but where i actually have to disengage that for me is like it's a it's a drive in five or ten now for mm -hmm. me in california and i have i've had more disengagements since i like it's been surprising and disappointing to me yeah. like i drove like uh from coming from my mom's house over to here mm -hmm. was a 45 minute drive across multiple things yeah. and i had a disengagement and it really bummed me out that there was a disengagement right because <laughs> some yeah. truck pulling a trailer like pulled over and the car followed it and i had to turn left right away and i'm like i don't want to do that so i disengaged and put it back on the thing but you know I'm I'm get, I'm actually getting into the zo in a zone yeah. where like I feel like if there's one disengagement on a drive, yeah. like that's an unusually yeah. bad drive now. Yeah. So I, I I was thinking of this kind of framework where, um, 
um, because Elon talks about this whole intervention, you know, per miles, or they, I guess they have a stat that a metric they're, you know, mm -hmm. tracking religiously. But I was thinking um, for the average driver, it's like, for me, I want something like a little bit more, I don't know, relatable. Granular. Yeah, granular. So the, yeah. the idea I had was take an average drive. I'm doing not too hard, not too easy, 15, 20 minute drive. Sure. How many of those trips am I doing consecutively consecutively without an intervention, right? Mm -hmm. So um, um, I think we're, I'm in that, at least for my personal experience, I'm in that between one and 10 kind of drives in mm -hmm. a row, you know, um, comfortably where, you know, it's like I can expect a good, you know, non intervention drive and then maybe a couple after, a few after, I don't know how long, but it's, it's somewhere between the one and 10. I'm thinking um, it just seems like next year we're headed to, I don't know what period of the, of the time, but between a 10 and a hundred drives, you mm -hmm. know, um, and then we'll get to uh, between a hundred and a thousand drives. We'll, we're, it's consecutive, right? Let's say 200 drives without an intervention. Mm -hmm. I think there's some level after a thousand drives in a row consecutively, it's really good. And I think that's when we talk about robotaxi as, as I mean, Tesla might be able to release it earlier in more, I don't know, limited environments, but after mm -hmm. a thousand drives in a row, as long as the car can manage those still infrequent interventions in a safe way, you mm -hmm. know, then we're looking at something that I think could, we could start the, not just the rollout, but the scaling. And then you'll get probably quickly to 10,000, you know, um, trips in a row. Um, so yeah, I think we're kind of, you know, marching toward that. You know, I, I feel like this year was a monumental year where we're, where FSD beta moved into that one to 10 trip kind of milestone. Um, yeah. So, you know, it like it progress f f feels like it speeds up when it feels like it's crossing some human relatable threshold. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that like FSD's uh, like its progress hasn't sped up. It's just getting closer yeah. to things that we yeah. can relate to. Yeah. You know, when, when you go from, you know, from, you know, 10 interventions down to one, that doesn't feel as meaningful as going from one to point one. Yeah. Right. It's like there's, you cross some threshold where it becomes really notable. Like, yeah, this is really qualitatively different than, than it was before in human terms. Yeah. Yeah. It's been yeah. really exciting to yeah. watch. It, it, it just feels like, I mean, the progress has been obviously fast before that, but it just feels like it's, it's reaching the area of human mm -hmm. competence and that's like gets yeah. people to notice it, you know, it's like, wow, it drives as good as me or, yeah, <laughs> it's or better, better than me. There's better a bunch sometimes. of things. Yeah. Like I notice uh, making lane changes in complicated traffic situations. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I can't see in multiple directions at one time. And so I kind of start, I'll be timid about moving into a lane where I'm not sure if a car's coming up. Yeah. Like this is a thing in, in Austin, the, the slew rate you get between lanes in terms of speed, like mm -hmm. it's a super rare for me in California to be in a lane and have somebody in the adjacent lane moving 20 miles an hour faster than I am when I'm on a highway. But that happens to me like every day yeah. here. Yeah. And so, so I'm kind of timid about, you know, moving into the fast lane because sometimes the guy's coming up on you fast and you do your lane change and he pops into that lane just as you do. Yeah. Right. And you can't see him because he's behind a car that's behind you. And so that's made me a bit more timid. And yesterday I had that happen to me like th like literally three times a row. Like I was in a lane, the car wanted to make a lane change. It starts to make the lane change. Everything looks fine. And then the car's pulling back in the lane. I look at when some guys come around behind the car and he's going really fast. Yeah. I'm like, woo. And then it starts the lane change. And then it happens again. <laughs> right. Yeah. So and I'm, it like that's the kind of thing that can make a really timid driver out of you. And, and it makes me really happy to have a safety system looking out for me in that yeah. situation. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Uh, we're here wrapping up um, our video on Optimus, deep dive on the slides that Tesla gave. We still have two other parts. One is um, on Tesla's FSD stack, which is the longest is section, yeah, yeah, by far. And then Dojo as well. Mm -hmm. And so we'll decide which to do first after this video. So uh, stay tuned and um, yeah, check out our next video um, on in this series. See you guys.